And so this is a reviewed uh, again this thing about property and who controls it. One thing that the government cannot privatize is a mineral estate that was granted in 1866. This is the mining law. This is the law that Congress adopted for miners, not lawyers, not politicians, but for miners. And remember, miners created this law when they were outlaws, when they were just as hunted down at some level uh, and thrown off of land as the Indians were at one time. It's not the same, it's, but it's similar. You were outlaws. You were told what to do or thrown off or shot or whatever you were done. And yes, there was invasion of the white settlers, the miners also, on Indian land. So there's a bunch of people that want the land. And that becomes problematic. And The United States of America was supposed to be a, a country of laws and a country of records so that Disregard, despite the fact of the questions of who has the land, because when you get into international law, it's pretty cut and dried. You're not a sovereign people if you're a conquered people. That's pretty simple. And there's lots of ways to conquer people. And as we learn in the Libra Code, there's lots of ways to occupy a nation without them even knowing it. And you don't have to tell them. There's one thing that, the, that the, these occupiers can't do, though, and they, they can't overcome the possession of the land by the grantor, if the grantor is the same occupier. And this was the fact, even when the miners were outlaws, and they came together to commit to peace between themselves by making laws through the mining districts. But first you had to create a mining district. So what we have here, when the miners were outlaws, you had miners coming together to create self-government. And this is right in the mining law. This is not something that we guess, and by golly, this is not something that we make up. This has not become some patriot myth, some, uh, some silver bullet idea. This is something that Congress has declared to be recognized in law. It also just so happens that the mineral estate, that the soil essentially, where all minerals reside, and uh, folks, if you talk about being with uh, understanding with the Indians, if you don't have a sense of your soil. You have no sense at all. It's period. That's it. If it is a it maybe almost a cliche, if it isn't grown, it has to be mined. Your life, your existence is the soil. Which, as I think about this, it's always a, always stuns me a bit to hear that people who have no clue, who profess to save trees, profess to save the environment, will say that a miner doesn't understand the soil when the miner owns the soil, and if he doesn't treat it right, he's not going to be where he's at very long. And I'm talking about the men and women and, and the little ones that would be miners. You get corporate corporations now, they're, they're, they, they make a little different issue. Why? Because they're after profit, not livelihood. Now, get back in. Miners were, uh, were outlaws. At the time they were outlaws, they made mining districts so that they could keep peace amongst themselves. They, they had no peace outwardly, but they made peace amongst themselves. And they did it by the establishment of mining districts. In 1866, Congress of the United States recognized and granted the rights of miners to establish mining districts and create local customs, rules, and regulations within their jurisdiction pertaining to how mineral deposits are located, recorded, worked, and held. This is still very much a part of the mining law of the United States. It, 30 U.S.C. 28, which states the miners in each mining district may make regulations not in conflict with the laws of the United States or with the laws of the state or territory in which the district is situated, governing the location, manner of recordation, amount of work necessary to hold a possession of the mining claim, subject to the following requirements. The location must be distinctly marked on the ground so that the, its boundaries can be readily traced. And such starts, essentially, the mining law. And what does that do? That starts your ability to claim a piece of land. And once you have a bunch of miners that are claiming pieces of land, they came together to form a district. Well, as I've been telling you, I've been working with the local mining association. They're different. An association is not a mining district. The mining association is not recognized in the mining law. Mining districts are. And this week, we were able to get together with the first meeting. It was an informational presentation on what it's going to take to form a mining district where uh, local to where uh, I am and the mining district mining association is. And what we're going to do and what we're trying to do is reestablish local government. 
Now, I'm not as politically wired and ready to go and, uh, and knowledgeable like William Roberts will tell you to do it to the political parties. I've had to come at it from a different angle. And uh, this is the way uh, I've had to f almost fall into seeing uh, this way. And in some regard, uh, uh, you know, we've listened to Ron Paul and this and that, and you see, you know, the more, and it's coming out. I don't know why uh, it takes so long for, for truth to really come out. He's a good guy and all, but, you know, it's all just a political system that's failed us, and we keep buying into it. Uh, we have no control over it. We have no ability to keep uh, the government in control. Now, William Roberts has an excellent pro uh, process that, that uh, uh, I tried to look into it doing that process locally, and uh, I didn't quite understand uh, it a little bit in order, in such a way that I thought I could affect the change that I think could come out of a mining district. And so in seeing the fact that the mining district is a district where landowners, possessors of the soil, with authority and jurisdiction have power, uh, I felt that was maybe uh, the place I wanted to look at. And over the last six years, I've been trying to explain to people that there's power. This word power in law is important. It's powerful. Uh, if you don't have power in law, you don't have a whole lot. And this is what I, uh, I guess what got me when I was hearing Russell Means talk about the fact that they back, the, the uh, Republic of Lakota, the Lakota tribe, has been going international, repeatedly international, and they're not getting... They're not getting any respect. They're getting the crumbs if they get that much. And what's amazing here, within the context and the confines of the uh, government of the United States, or is this little provision for mining districts. And guess what? They have power. And you know they have so much power that the system itself is now afraid of what the miners are doing to reinstitute this power and this reassertion of a control that people have inherent in them that seems to be disregarded by lots of other people that seem to believe that an elected office means that you're a dictator over the fiefdom that they've given to you just because a bunch of half of the people there voted you in. Stay tuned and we're going to go through this mining district issue. No joke about the, the one who controls the land and absolutely uh, controls the soil, absolutely has a power. Now, the problem with that is, is you have to continue to possess it. Now, as long as there's a law in this country that's re respected, then you have a possibility of maintaining a peace and some, some form of control. So this is my view, uh, my, this is my, my concern. Uh, we are so far down uh, the, uh, the trail here, of law, uh, away from what would be law. I'm getting, it's getting, it's, I told you, it's a foot race. My thought is, as long as we're in that foot race, we'll be okay. We never can stop running in this foot race for the law. The law, as long as it's reflected, we're going to have a memory, and we're going to have an example on how to maintain the soil. In other words, possession of the land. And you'll have an opportunity to understand and have example how you throw off an occupier or one that presumes itself so. In this case, I'm talking about the United States government itself. Now, as long as law exists... This mining law shows in examples how property is possessed, what it is you possess, that those people that have conveyed to them by this occupying force, authority and jurisdiction, means that the, the grantor of it, in this case the government, is, is, stopped, is stopped from reasserting a right to what it grants to you, and that that's the soil itself, and that if law and international law rules, not rule of law, but law itself rules, we have an opportunity to impart the power that people have over the land. This has been recognized in the courts for a long, long time. Prior to 1866, the power of mining districts and local mining customs and local mining rules were very much the land, the law of the land and the minerals of the far west that were recognized by the counties, states, and territories already having a place within the judicial system. That's why I preface this whole thing. As long as there's still law, there's a chance, folks. So you know, as soon as there's no law, it's no holds barred. And you better start paying attention to what Russell Means talks about. 
it's not just his people in in, in South Dakota. It's all uh, indigenous people. And I have a question. If we're all living in a reservation, then we might be very close to seeing how law doesn't exist. Then the only thing we have at, at our disposal is our numbers, our unified numbers. And I won't, I won't uh, venture to say how those will have to be used. Right now we're doing United We Strike and UnitedWeStrike.com withdraw, folks, and then reassert. Empower yourself with knowledge and act through it. I hear lots of good ideas. They just need to be implemented. The miners are starting to get t tired of being run down with a law that was supposed to be so clear and so simple that even a dumb miner could understand it. Why? Because the dumb miner made that law. And Congress adopted it. Prior to the law, prior to the minerals being granted, folks, you have to understand the dynamic here. This is how unique this mineral estate is that we've abandoned as Americans. We, we tend to believe that they can be privatized outside of our own holding and hands. And until we get the idea that it doesn't, it's going to take us to start back, step back in. But we may actually give this country over to that without a fight. And thank you for tuning in behind the woodshed, folks. And uh, appreciate that you spend your time here to listen and to learn. Uh, it's going to take what we, uh, everything that I know to do and everything that you know to do uh, to, to turn this around. Uh, I'm attempting to do what I know with in, in helping other people move this thing along. If nothing else, folks, we're learning. We're learning. Uh, well, as I say, we're in interesting times. We're either going to learn we don't live in an America that, as we were told, and we have no way to control that and take it back, uh, or we do. And uh, I'm, I guess, maybe I'm the eternal optimist that believes that we can. So, as, as I'll get to the meeting, uh, some of the meeting we had this week. Uh, Friday, uh, it was said that what we're doing is unprecedented. Well, I don't know if I agree with that because mining districts are are have already been, were already known uh, to the judiciary prior to 1866. What's unprecedented is, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me. Uh, what's unprecedented is that we're remembering the power that people had to to make their own self-government. Even long after the passage of the mining law, the United States in 1866 was amended in 1870 and 1872, the states continued to recognize the authority of jurisdiction to miners to establish mining districts and their empowerment to create local laws pertaining to mining. Now that might not seem like so much until you understand what this law of 1866 touched on, folks. It touched on the conveyance of the soil, it touched on the conveyance of the water to the soil, and the use of the soil, and ditches outside of the boundaries of the claim, and access, ingress and egress, and the construction of highways. Now I don't know about you, but I think if I just took those uh, four things, and there's more in that act, yeah, that, I wouldn't need to have a whole lot more at my disposal in a, to, to, to live on. You know, the minerals is what makes the wealth. In other words, if it's not grown, it's mined. Uh, you will have a portion to give to society. Uh, there's wealth there. It, control of the land so that you're not going to be oppressed and run out. You have access rights to and from to the place and back and to keep yourself going. And you have water. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems to be... Uh, if that's about all I was given in a, in a desert island, I think I could probably do okay. And you're empowered by it. For example, despite the early attempts of the Governor Lane and Judge Deedee to hamstring the vested authority of miners in Oregon, the rights of miners to create districts and laws still remains, even though organized mining district began to vanish after <clears throat> World War I. Excuse me. William Lair Hill in his Codes and General Laws of Oregon, published at San Francisco in 1892, offers a tremendous insight into how mining districts gained official recognition in the state of Oregon through Section 3831, which states that, quote, it shall be the duty of the county clerk or any county upon the receipt of notice of a miners' meeting organization organizing a miners' district in said county with a dis 
description of the boundaries thereof, and to record the same in a book to be kept in his office as other county records, to be uh, a, called a book of record of mining claims, and upon the petition of the parties interested, he may appoint a deputy for such district who shall reside in said county or its vicinity and shall record all mining claims and water rights in the order in which they are presented for the record, close quote. Understand here, uh, in the order, that's the appropriation right. So we have the law of appropriation working on this. Meanwhile, at section 3832 recognizes, quote, minors shall be empowered to make local laws. Let me read that, folks. I told you, minors have power. And there's power, you don't have anything if you have, unless you have power in law. And here's the section that reflects. See, these laws by the state could not be in contravention of the federal law, which tells you that the land that a miner gets, and this is every one of you folks that chooses to step up and go and, and, and can and does find yourself a valuable mineral deposit. I'm talking to everybody here at least in the United States, or those of you that want to be American citizens of the United States that existed in 1866. Minors shall be empowered to make local laws in relation to the possession of water, the possession of the workings of placer claims, and the survey and sale of town lots in mining camps subject to the laws of the United States. Now, I've been reading here from a, pre a prepared statement to the webmaster, uh, Kirby, with the Mining Association in his uh, presentation. I could go on and read some more. I won't. I just wanted to point out we're talking about things that come right out of the law, the black and white, that are very powerful things indeed. Now, that was just presented to a room full of uh, miners at a mid-month Mining Association m meeting that you can find the website at miningrights.org. And uh, thank you uh, for posting that link in the chat room earlier, miningrights.org. We went through and described and discussed the uh, partic more of the particulars about forming a mining district. Why? Well, because the government is failing us. And uh, this is one thing that at least miners can do to establish their own local rule. Now, it does only pertain to uh, mining. However, and you hear me talk about it periodically behind the woodshed, and for those of you that are tuned in that are property owners in any regard, you need to really pay attention here, uh, because the miner, even though the miner only has a uh, uh, an unpatented interest, it is as patent as regards the conveyance, unless there's fraud shown, and then a, any fraud would vitiate that agreement. So these are as patent. So anybody that has an interest in land that attaches to a patent has these authorities sitting investing in them. So the miners can come together. They're uh, empowered. Shall be a empowered to come together for their own protection. Now, it's been questioned that maybe mining districts can't be formed, but I, I have to chuckle a little bit of that. I don't know why a mining district couldn't be formed when you can when you can uh, form a water district, you can form a fire district, a s police service district, you can do a, a a utility district of all of all forms. Those seem to be quite fine to be formed. But all of a sudden, a miner steps up, and now there's question of whether or not a miner can make a mining district. This is how afraid of this that uh, the system seems to be. Uh, not all of it either. Some of the system is actually saying we need to see the mining district. Why? Because they want to. They they know we know the law a bit, and they want to see. I think more to the fact they want to see how it gets done. So our problem is miners is getting together. And all it takes is a few miners. If we go to the law, it only takes six or more persons, it says in the law. Uh, it, it was in Nevada. But it doesn't take many to actually create a mining district. And what you are empowered to do is make local law. Now, what's the power of that? Well, as you see, your, your, your um, public lands in particular being uh, confiscated, as we heard in Jimmy X prior, to two hours prior, uh, Vilsack and talking about USDA and uh, and talking about food stamps and and uh, they also they also manage the forest lands. Uh, fascinating how that how that all works. Uh, but uh, you saw he wasn't talking about anything. He wasn't explaining the the fact that, that the wealth is out that the USD is controlling to take away from you that they wouldn't have to issue food stamps to. And that's what they're doing against the miner. They're taking away his power to get the wealth. And within the federal context is a thing called coordination, which a mining district has direct access to. Stay tuned.
And thank you for doing it today behind the woodshed, folks. And talk about mining districts. Why? Because they offer empowerment to people. Uh, they have, that's all of you that want to. In fact, uh, you know, the only limitation is finding that valuable de mineral deposit. And, and you too are a miner. And boy, you know, if you just, uh, it's funny, some people are more lucky than ours, others um, in this. Uh, as you, you hear, it's not all, it's also, it's not so easy, but uh, unless you're one of those people. That said, when you de dedicate your life to mining, uh, you, at least by the mining law, you'd think you were protected. But when you see the uh, agenda that's rolling down, I said the UN declared war, the undeclared war, you see Agenda 21. You're hearing about uh, lots and lots and lots of uh, ways that they're intruding. In other words, you hear on uh, William Roberts' show, Become Vocal Local, early on when they're blowing the, you know, he's in Missouri there, and they're blowing the levees and this and that. You see the agenda and the FEMA hazard mitigation and all that. And then you find out after they blew all the levees and moved all the miners, all the, excuse me, the farmers out now, the agricultural interests, they move them out. Then you hear in the news that Soros is buying all up through another agency. To do what? Well, we'll see. Apparently, there's uh, big money right now in uh, buying farmland up. Yeah, well, I wonder why. And what they're actually doing is they're controlling the grain silos. If it's not mine, it's grown, folks. So they were talking to the soil. And people are so clueless as to what's going on, they don't understand that there's a bigger agenda. Well, Getting to the federal agenda, at least, possibly even even thwarting the independent, the uh, ind uh, excuse me, the international agenda, because of the nature of the mineral estate, the lowly old miner has the ability to step up, form a district, and now have an equal seat at the table as any other government, because a mining district is a government, and all that has to happen to form a government is a number of miners in a get together. Define a district, give the district a name, post that with a local authority, and that's pretty much it. Now, that, that was the way it handled in the past, and the districts are very small. Today, the as you as you hear uh, uh, across just about any 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 anywhere there's news. How comprehensive the, the battles are all over the place. Uh, how, how, it's almost uh, beyond us to keep to keep up, and I think they, they do that on purpose. In, in one regard, looking at the mining districts, it allows us to focus, at least for myself, focus on one thing. You understand, folks, that the creating a, creation of a mining district is no different than the creation of a m mining claim. You have to give notice of everybody around you that you're going to form the claim, and you can't interfere with other claims. Uh, and you uh, then have exclusive authority over the territory you design, and you give yourself your claim and name. Now, most people don't understand this, but uh, a mining claim is an unorganized mining district, uh, that each mining claim is an unorganized mining district. Therefore, each mining claim is actually a district. It's why a district can be formed, because each mining claim has power. That means that each miner, whether man, woman, or little one, because there's no, under the mining law, there's no distinction here. Anybody who could find the mineral was given the grant of the land, surprisingly, even though the states only recognize uh, this, uh, the capacity of majority, which I found fascinating, and no one's challenged that, although there's not many young ones here. We need to get more young ones in. So the mining organizations, uh, mining associations, are not mining uh, districts. And uh, this is a, there's been an exam, uh, some question as to whether or not a mining district can form, but it's all been based on lawyers who, is, who, who uh, the, or the most recent information is that lawyers that made associations. And that's not a mining district. So we have to be very uh, term, term specific here. Mining districts are allowed, uh, are formed by people who are possessors of soil. And they have power, and they shall have power. Why? It's because the power was given to him before, and all the state can do is acknowledge that. Otherwise, it would come contrary to the laws of the United States. So now we're, we're, in law, we're in a position of power, and all we have to do is give everybody in an area notice, and uh, then it becomes what? Uh, like we say with the patent. You have to accept in. It's like any other jurisdiction, isn't it? So uh, we called the miners together here Friday, and we gave them a lot of this information, and what I wanted to keep put, put out to you today... and. For those of you that are tuned in particular to mining law or uh, property law or what you can do for yourself or what you can do to help, even if you're not miners, you can help. 
And as you help, you'll understand more how you can do things. Uh, but the mining law is very empowered, so we want to start at least start there. That uh, we are now a group together. We have now placed before an association of miners the idea of what it's going to take and that they have the ability to form a district that can sit at the table with the federal government as equals. But I'm going to suggest to you all, uh, without uh, promoting this too heavily, uh, it will not be as equals in that regard either. Why? Because the mineral estate is above and apart all other law. Now think about that, folks. Above and apart all other law. Uh, because, and you're going to hear this coming, I hear it coming now with the ho uh, other hosts are talking about it, uh, you're going to find out, as we've been talking about the uh, straw man, you're going to find out something about trust a law and grant law. Uh, just what I've been talking about behind the woodshed all this time. And when you finally see this stuff, uh, although I don't necessarily get into the straw man issue, uh, to me it's, it's a little bit, uh, well, when you're dealing in major corruptions in your judiciary, you might as well just give all that up because it's not going to happen. As we're finding out, even the miners uh, were now being told in the courts, the government grantor is actually saying it granted nothing, which, which will soon enough be found to be the, the fraud that it is. The point is, is, this is how dastardly these devils are. And it, it just, I'm trying to tell you that you, it, it's what it takes. Uh, it's, you have to put your mind onto what it takes to prevail. And I guess that's what I'm saying when I, I, I fully appreciate what Russell Means is talking about. When he speaks of being an Indian, speaking about how Indians were treated. And then he turns around and looks at the rest of the United States and says, all oh, y'all are just living on a big reservation. So the law says that miners are empowered. They shall be empowered. There's a federal law that says that they also shall have an equal uh, position at the table. And I'm suggesting to you, because of the nature of the mineral state, it's not so equal. It's actually superior to the agency of the government who works in the, as a trustee. Now you got the words, trustee. We're back into trust law. And you are the beneficiary on top of being the grantee. Now, I'm saying that uh, to people that may not understand how they can relate this to themselves not having anything to do with mining. What I'm suggesting to you, this is the example. If you can find this in your life on how to condition, uh, position yourself, explain your status in law in this position, you will empower yourself. Now, the miners have a choice right now. and I, I was, uh, For as much as I'm for a mining district, I got criticized for being um, uh, giving a roller coaster description on on what we're doing here uh, with the with the uh, benefits and risks of a mining district. My problem with it is that folks, if you do something like this, you can't back off. It's a war you can't stop, and, it, and you have to look at it that way. You can't just half do this. And the problem with the mining district is it takes everybody pulling on the same rope at the same time. You can't have people stopping. for lots of reasons. So, my problem is not that we don't we form the mining district. My my problem is the same problem I see in the in America that we're not united and we don't persist that we're not vigilant and diligent and we're not principled. And that's where we're back to Russell means. He's talking about principles and his age 72 72 moons, uh, so I guess he says, 72 years of life on this earth. He talks of wisdom. But it's time we start imposing some of that for ourselves. That's what we're doing behind the woodshed, I hope. Stay tuned. And thank you for tuning in today, Behind the Woodshed. Uh, yeah, so my problem with the mining district isn't that we shouldn't form it. We have to form it. But will we have enough help? Will we have enough people coming together? Again, the microcosm of America. If you don't have enough people moving in a mass, whether or not they do or withdraw from doing, in other words, you stop flying on airplanes, and all of a sudden they're going to have to look at whether or not they're going to keep those airplanes in the sky. Maybe it's going to change some of the policies on the ground. So we don't have enough force, enough mass moving in a direction. It's just physics, I guess. Uh, we're not going to cause the change that we need, and we're going to be wasting our time. So... My problem is not that we should form the district. That, I've been advocating that for six years. It's, do we have the people to stand up to do it? Now, notice to the miners, those of you that can make it uh, next month, 
uh, let's go to mindrights.org for the ad, for the date. I can't remember. So the first weekend in the the first Friday of the month. It'll be September, I suspect. The point is, is that when we start it, we can't stop. A lot of people have questions about what the efficacy of this is. Well, my the, the thing we can't see is the power that's going to come to bear once we get involved. And if you don't know about the mining law, you don't understand about that. So this was also another problem about getting miners to understand the mining law. Now, we've come a long way. The miners have to make a decision, though. I can't do it. I can't take all my knowledge, and I can't take my uh, the experiences I've had, and I can't apply it by myself. Everybody has to. Now, there's a the miners came together. They have noticed now that there's a there's a, a movement afoot, if you will, to create a mining district. They will have to, and they will do this in the next a couple of uh, meetings, I suspect. It has to move kind of quickly, also. But for all we don't even know, we still have to move quickly and decisively. They will have to decide for themselves how many miners want to come together, for what purpose. Uh, they'll have to define their district. They'll have to give it a name. And then they will have to go to task with the government. And I'll tell you what, I'm pretty excited at one level about it. It's going to it'll start to right the ship pretty quickly over, over some time, certainly. But at least it's not going to be where a miner is now speaking in the lone wilderness. Now, the idea for you all, it, as I said during the meeting, was that the, the district has to be manageable. And so this is for everybody who decides, you know, think about how these districts, these local partnership districts are being made, these special tax districts. This is how it's being done on a legal entity, uh, a de facto corporation standard underneath the corporate states. That's how it's being done as associations, these partnerships. They're all, everybody, anybody who has the A21 plan is doing this against you already. What you haven't figured out is you could do it for yourself. Now, the difference in the miners, they get to have a district that's recognized by Congress. And they're dealing in the substance of the land, which puts them above and apart. That's the, the only and subtle, although the significant difference. So I'm, I'm talking to everybody here if you really start thinking about what's going on. Now, back to the miner. The miner in, uh, in uh, Northern California and Southern Oregon is going to have to make a decision whether they want to stand up. I'm asking that they do. Although I'm, I'm waffling to the point that I keep throwing in into the mix the downside, which is don't start it unless you're going to continue. And I think everybody should be able to agree with that. You, you have to engage something with a passion, and you don't give up. Once you start it, you can't stop it. And that's what I'm uh, a little dubious as to the miners in, in Southern Oregon and Northern California. I'm saying that as a challenge. I want them to rise up. I can't do it by myself. And the five or so handful of people that have always been doing this over the last six years can't continue on their own either. Everyone has to rise up. So it's a challenge to those that will show up on the next meeting. Uh, come with a name. Come with a territory. Come with a purpose. Come with a way to finish this thing and get it going and then make it work. It's a 100% effort. It's going to be 100% of the time. But many hands make light work, and that's why I'm suggesting I'm, uh, I'm putting the challenge out. I can tell you that there's a lot of support for a district. The problem is do we have enough hands to man the ship, if you will. And this will be your problem wherever you do this, even if it's not a mining district. And people are funny things, too. And we have to have patience. And uh, for me, it's been six years watching, uh, figuring out the mining law and watching the miners come along, and a power they don't even know, though, that they have. But I can't wait at one level. On the other hand, I can't, and everybody be careful, learn to discern also to your efficacy in doing something as to whether or not it will be worth starting if no one else is going to follow through. That doesn't mean we don't. We're pushing to make it happen. But be very careful that you don't end up finding out you're the only one holding onto the rope because all of a sudden uh, people got tired and, uh, and the work got real hard or something comes up with some obstruction. Some excuse is what it ends up being. So mining district can be formed. Uh, I, uh, I hope that it will be. Uh, what it's interesting, for those of you that want to check into it, a suggestion was made to, re, uh, to create a mining district that, that mimics uh, the, the boundary, the boundaries of which 
were exactly that of the, propo the uh, proposed uh, state of Jefferson. And I'm putting that out there, not as an answer, but as a, as a suggestion of an opportunity or uh, the uh, way to think about this. Either the mining district gets formed by the size of a county. It used to be down to the gulch. It used to be down to the valley. A few miners in the valley got together to make their own rules. Well, now the political ends, the agenda, the international imposition now requires that we look. Uh, the miners of old didn't have, a, didn't have all this to deal with, so we have to look a little bit differently. And we have to make a little bit different uh, decision on a mining district. But the, uh, the, the state of Jefferson, the proposed state of Jefferson, fits uh, what we want to do very, very well, although it might become a little bit unruly. So as those of you that are listening, uh, that may be participating, and as you put into your calculations on, first of all, that you're going to participate, secondly, that you're going to participate 100%, and uh, you're going to rise to the call, if you will, and then what kind of a mining district do you want to prepare, and what size is it, and how do we manage that so that it's successful? Is it best that we go by the uh, minimally the size of the county, and just start there? Or do we go ahead and take a little bit bigger hold because of the agenda that's against us? And do we make it the size of a state? Now, the proposal also was, well, how do you manage that? Well, it all depends. We've got a clear canvas on how we manage that. And uh, that is how we, we have to become intelligent enough to be able to do that. We can take uh, an area that size and divide it up by the counties as was, uh, we can almost call them mining camps, but they're the size of the counties that exist. Just to give you an idea of how this thing works when you take government in your own hands, this is pretty exciting stuff. And it's empowered by the law of miners. And it's empowered and acknowledged by Congress. And so I'm excited at one level because I want to see it happen, but I'm not so excited to see when you run into a problem that all of a sudden people give up. I don't need to do that. As I told everybody at the meeting, I don't need you all. As an unassociated mining claim, I am a mining district. My, uh, the co-owner of the claim is a mining district. And we're dealing with the government already that way. But you know it's a whole lot easier if a whole bunch of people get together. And this is why it's important not to be divisive on whichever direction you go. It's easy for me to say, let's focus on the mining law, because that's already written in there. A little bit more difficult is things that aren't quite so sure, especially when you lived up in many generations where the government beat you down, didn't give you the correct uh, teachings that you're supposed to. They took away your principles. You know, that melting pot wasn't such a good idea when it, when it divorced you of your memory of your culture, whatever that is. And that's the question. We don't even know anymore. And so that's easy for us to have our no to be guided by the nose. So... The call out, I'm asking again, we had a good turnout at the meeting to form a mining district. Uh, it's up to us now as miners to decide that. We have a lot of people that are not miners that are, that are showing up. I think this is a great opportunity for us to remember what people do for self-government and to do that and to bring that forward in a way that's effective. And, and not like what we see, and, and pardon me for not liking what I saw happen around Ron Paul, and what looked to be the big, a big, uh, for as much as I like the guy, he's a congenial uh, doctor. I like that, you know, he's just got a, he's just a good to temperament. Uh, somehow that just didn't, uh, didn't set well with me. Uh, and it all seems like a setup. The whole thing just seems like a setup. I don't have to worry about that as a miner in a mining district as long as the mining district is wholesome, is integrated, and is active. I got a direct communication to the law that's going to be applied. And don't underestimate the fact and the power that the sheriff is now coming. To, he came to the meeting, too, and he's supporting us also. And how much power that starts to bring when you have the law, the enforcement of the law behind you, too. Stay tuned to the last segment. We're going to get some, some news today.